On this episode of Skeptico, mathematician and chaos theory pioneer, Dr. Ralph Abraham. Chaos theory presents a lot of problems when it comes to measurement, which is really the, the nuts and bolts of science. In other words, if you know uh, the state of the world exactly, well, almost exactly, with a slight error, then you cannot make a long-term prediction. So we don't know about global climate warming, for example, on the basis of mathematical models because the mathematical models are chaotic in this te technical sense that uh, the flap of a butterfly wing would make a huge difference in the prediction of the model long term. Now, as we take this kind of mathematical model for complex systems upstairs into the realm of consciousness, and then obviously consciousness has a lot of parts. For one thing, if you think of the individual consciousness of six billion people on the planet being somehow knitted together through communication by reading, writing, cell phones, World Wide Web, etc., into a complex system, then obviously that complex system is going to have very chaotic behavior. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode, Dr. Ralph Abraham joins us to talk about chaos theory, mathematics, and building a better model of consciousness. Now, you may remember that we heard from Ralph just a few episodes ago when we looked back at the dialogues between Terence McKenna, Rupert Sheldrick, and Ralph Abraham, but I was so intrigued by some of the things that he had to say that I wanted to contact him and get a full interview, and I did, and here it is. Today we welcome Dr. Ralph Abraham to Skeptico. Dr. Abraham is a very highly regarded professor of mathematics at the University of California at Santa Cruz and a pioneer in the area of chaos theory. Now, if you had a chance to listen to episode 196 of Skeptico and our look back at those very interesting dialogues between Terence McKenna, Rupert Sheldrick, and Ralph Abraham, then you got a sampling of some of the deep thinking and the range of topics that this guy gets into. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a full interview with him, and I'm just delighted that you agreed to join me. Thanks so much, and welcome to Skeptico. Happy to be here. Well, you know where I thought we'd start is math and mathematics, because it's obviously been a big part of your life. And in listening to some of the interviews you've done, I was fascinated at just the way you talk about your personal connection to mathematics and mathematical thinking. Because I think, you know, as someone who isn't in the field, it's almost like, gosh, what is this guy really talking about? What is it about math? Can you maybe get us a little bit closer to the mathematical mind in general and maybe how, how a mathematician thinks? Yes, okay. I fell in love with mathematics around age 15. And uh, since then until the present moment, it's really been the, the dominant thing. And my frustration is that so few people are willing to think mathematically or are uh, afraid of the language of mathematics, have had a bad experience with mathematics in school, or for whatever reason, have been rendered uh, in, unable to go into this uh, space. So when I try to talk about whatever, since I'm thinking about it mathematically, I'm having a practical problem in uh, communicating. So after beginning in mathematics, so some years passed before I discovered this, uh, this illness called mathematical anxiety or the math avoidance reflex. And this is by now very well acknowledged in education circles that something is wrong with the way mathematics is taught with the result that uh, very clever people go through school and don't quite get it even if later on they get a Nobel Prize in physics or something, there are just a few people that for some some personal accidental reason escape the handicap 
of math anxiety. So I was lucky, I think, because of my mother's interest in mathematics that I escaped this stigma. Anyway, mathematical thinking is, in any case, uh, somewhat difficult because it is less related to ordinary experience than scientific thinking, artistic thinking, and, and other types of intelligence. Here's an interesting quote of yours. You said, mathematics is completely separate in its philosophical outlook and in the personality of the people who pursue it who are sometimes diametrically opposite to scientists. What did you mean? I think a lot of people would find that surprising. Well, it's surprising because for some reason math and science have been linked in the popular imagination as closely related areas of thought. So in the ecology of ideas, there are these different subjects like uh, anthropology, history, and, and so on. These domains can be thought of as uh, nations in a kind of a world geometry of thought. Popularly, people think of math and science being in, in the same corner, maybe because it's true that science, uh, some kinds of science, require a lot of mathematics. Other kinds don't. For example, the taxonomy of plants, uh, how different plants can be recognized by their physical characteristics and sorted into different bins. Uh, it doesn't really require very much mathematics. It requires a lot of science, which is you have to be a careful observer of nature and take good notes and learn the literature in the field and all that. So there is, a, let us admit, a certain overlap between math and science, uh, but I maintain that they are fundamentally different in the outlook and the kind of people who pursue them. In fact, many times people ask me if I'm a scientist or they ask me a question about science. And I have to say, well, I don't know because I'm not a scientist and not only I haven't studied that, but you know, I've read about it, but I don't really get it because my way of thinking is, is so different. Fascinating. Let's dive in there a little bit. As a mathematician and as someone who's interested in consciousness, how might those go forward together? How can the models and model building abilities of the mathematician aid us in understanding this consciousness enigma? Well, well, exactly. Uh, model building, I think, is the key idea. Where mathematics has assisted the, the development of science, the history of science of the past 2,000 years, let us say, uh, from my view, is largely in uh, in model building. However, there's a, a certain uh, very narrow kind of model which has for a long time predominated as the successful model building strategy in the sciences. And this has to do with those uh, fancy formulas that you see Nobel Prize winners are writing on the blackboard in their Nobel uh, lectures and and so on. A lot of uh, symbols, symbolic equations based on uh, algebra and uh, calculus, mathematical analysis, and so on. And uh, quantum mechanics, uh, general relativity, electricity and magnetism, these major branches of physics have a um, mathematical foundation like Maxwell's equation, Einstein equation, the Schrodinger equation. These uh, equations belong to um, an area of mathematics which is nowadays seen as being a very small area. So we have, let us say, in uh, global analysis, so-called a dynamical systems theory. We have completely, uh, enormously more general strategies for building models in which there are no equations and which can only be explored with computer simulation. And in fact, there are computer simulations for which the model isn't even known, as in uh, neural, neural network theory, for example. We, we get the computer to improve its model. Maybe we give it a starting point, and then we get it to improve the model by testing its behavior. If it does the job well, say parsing English language or the human genome or something like that, we then uh, give it a carrot, and otherwise we give it a slap. 
And so a learning algorithm produces a working program that no human has ever seen. Uh, it exists in the computer, and it is a successful model for a whole branch of science, which is not based on the classical mathematical methods of ordinary and partial differential equations, uh, the binomial theorem, factoring polynomials, uh, trigonometric functions, Fourier analysis, and all that enormous and wonderful machinery of classical mathematics, which provided the mathematical, the essential framework and foundation for all the current branches of physics. So we have more general, since especially the computer revolution, we have more and better methods of model building. Think of fractal geometry, for example. You know, Galileo said uh, he was, uh, you know, a religious uh, Christian kind of person in his uh, time around the year 1600. Uh, and he said, if you uh, if you want to know the mind of God, then you have to read the book that God wrote. And that book is nature. And nature is written. God it, wrote it in the language of mathematics. And by that I mean, he writes, circles, triangles, line segments, and so on. In other words, all the paraphernalia of geometry known in his time, that he imagined that that was the language of nature, suddenly computer revolution comes along. Suddenly, after that, another equally important revolution, the computer graphic revolution. Suddenly, it's like a microscope or a telescope has been invented in which we can look into a certain kind of shape in computer simulation and discover fractals. And then we study, we see all kinds of beautiful colored fractal patterns that are self-similar in all scales. And with that enlightenment, we look away from the computer screen and again at nature, and there we see the litter on the forest floor. We see the shape of clouds and mountains seen in silhouette. We see fractals. We see that nature is actually a book written in a language that Galileo didn't know. He had no idea, and since he didn't know it, he couldn't see these things in nature were invisible until the cognitive apparatus was revealed for the first time into the collective human mind. And then we look in nature and we see a whole lot more. In, in this way, uh, we see a, an example of a model building in nature is so successful that it can make images of nature in science fiction films and, and, and the like that are almost indistinguishable on the resolution of a photograph from the real thing. And this model building is all going forward with a kind of model building technology, a branch of mathematics, fractal geometry, that was totally unknown before the year 1975. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And let's dive into that, all the way into it, and talk about God, if you will, because on the last episode of Skeptico, we had a chance to talk with neuroscientist and parapsychology researcher, Dr. Diane Powell, and she's investigating some of these questions of consciousness by looking at and working with savants, which I think is very interesting and maybe has some parallels. But anyways, we got to talking about consciousness and whether there was some order of consciousness, which, of course, is really just kind of an intellectual way of getting back to the Galileo thing and talking about God, really, if there's an ordered consciousness. But anyways, I asked her whether she thought that her conclusion was that there was some kind of hierarchical order to consciousness. And she said yes, and that chaos theory was one of the things that she felt points us in that direction. So you maybe touched on it a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit, first of all, what chaos theory is and this thing called the butterfly effect and stuff like that, and whether or not you think it does point us towards that hierarchical structure of consciousness? You bet. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a really difficult story. Uh, chaos theory, you know, I mean, this enormous development, explosion of uh, new ideas, discoveries, and in in the area of mathematics, especially computational mathematics, it, it's going on. It's derivative of the computer revolution and the computer graphic revolution. So, uh, chaos theory began 
Uh, you know, people trace it to Poincaré a century ago in a kind of a, a theoretical development he had. Actually, uh, Poincaré was a savant, okay? He's one of the uh, original mathematical savants that was studied by psychologists. So uh, Poincaré was one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time, uh, wrote 500 pages, 100 books, died at the age of 52. I mean, he's an incredible person. So the story he told uh, in the book on the psychology of mathematical invention is this. I was uh, headed for a picnic with my family. We were standing in the bus stop waiting for the bus. I had been working on the problem, and I was frustrated. I couldn't prove this theorem, and I was not thinking about it. We were on the way to a picnic. When I put my foot on the step of the bus to go up, the solution to this problem popped into my mind. I was so sure it was right that I didn't think about it for another minute when I went on the picnic. So in this flash of illumination, on previously completely unknown mathematical fact, emerged into his mind. He foresaw something that turned out to be right. And I have had this experience, and many mathematicians have this experience, and it's not the same as the scientific approach, where you probe nature with all the instruments you've got with your with your voltmeter, with your chemical kit, and, and so on. It was a completely different thing where mathematical knowledge comes from is gradually revealed over the course of thousands of years, maybe uh, more than 30,000 years of mathematical discovery of different bits of things that end up actually fitting all together and including as a small subset many models for natural phenomenon. Isn't there also a connection there, I think, back to a point you were making earlier in the difference between the mathematical I guess, approach and the scientific approach, chaos theory presents a lot of problems when it comes to measurement, which is really the the nuts and bolts of science. I mean, chaos theory kind of throws into question the whole idea of measurement and how measurement really works or, or how effective it can really be. But maybe we better back up and give people a sense for how chaos theory, bring it down to earth in a way that they can understand, maybe the butterfly effect or, or, or something like that. Uh, well, yes, I got uh, carried away with the importance of the computer revolution in terms of new mathematical ideas. And uh, chaos theory is just, uh, was one of them, was one of the first uh, revelations of the, the uh, computer revolution. So this uh, first observation took place in 1961. So this is some 80 years or so after Poincaré had an idea, an intuition, uh, that uh, was subsequently validated by a computer discovery in 1961. So at that time, uh, computers had been around for a while, analog and digital computers of great importance in World War II. And following it, while studying a mathematical model with a computer in the Department of Electrical Engineering in Kyoto University, this first observer of chaotic phenomena in a mathematical model, uh, Yoshi Ueda, a professor, then graduate student of electrical engineering, he uh, saw this, that uh, subsequently known uh, by a lot of people as this metaphor of the butterfly effect, that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil could precipitate a tornado in western New Jersey. So this, um, this idea has, as you suggested, an important implication for science that has to do with measurement, because it says the flap of the butterfly wing. In other words, if you know uh, the state of the world exactly, well, almost exactly, with a slight error, then you cannot make a long-term prediction. So we don't know about global climate warming, for example, on the basis of mathematical models because the mathematical models are chaotic in this te technical sense that uh, the flap of a butterfly wing would make a huge difference in the prediction of the model long term. There would be either global 
warming or global cooling, but you couldn't tell for sure because you can't measure the state of the the, the world, the atmospheric chemistry, the insulation of the sun, and so on. You can't measure it all with perfect accuracy. And the experience of uh, dynamical systems as finally observed and discovered with computer graphics in 1961 and subsequently that the slightest uh, uh, error in the measurement means a huge error in the long-term behavior. Uh, that means that this new style of model building that I've been bragging about is actually no good for long-term prediction. It is good for kind of understanding complex systems. So this is why I'm going to uh, connect with uh, understanding of consciousness now, the hierarchical structure of consciousness, that our models for climate are complex systems in the sense there are many different parts. There's the solar radiation. There is the atmospheric chemistry. There is the activity of humans creating heat on the planet of the surface and changing the um, reflectivity of the surface of the planet and by building a lot of buildings with aluminum roofs or whatever. That um, a complex system in that sense, when you try to model it mathematically, always results in a chaotic dynamical system. So the understanding of uh, chaos theory, as studied by mathematicians beginning in 1961 and ongoing in the present time, this um, understanding, technical knowledge of chaotic dynamical systems, has practical significance when we try to model a complex system, because the complex system will behave, behave chaotically. So before the understanding of chaos theory, 1961 and so on, mathematical models for complex systems were no good. They always resulted in chaotic behavior that the scientists would then interpret as uh, an artifact, a failure of the model. And so the models for complex systems were thrown out. Suddenly, they could be understood, even though not predictive, they could be understood to a degree through the new teachings of chaos theory. So the practical implication was that modeling complex systems becomes possible. Now, as we take this kind of mathematical model for complex systems upstairs from physical systems like uh, planet of planet Earth uh, climate into the realm of consciousness, and then obviously consciousness has a lot of parts. For one thing, if you think of the individual consciousness of six billion people on the planet, being somehow knitted together through communication by reading, writing, cell phones, World Wide Web, etc., into a complex system, then obviously that complex system is going to have very chaotic behavior. And the techniques of chaos theory in modeling uh, complex systems could be applied to consciousness. And uh, that, of course, has been carried out uh, as a research program by a number of people, uh, about which I've written a book, uh, by the way, Modeling Consciousness Using These Techniques of Chaos Theory, uh, called uh, Demystifying the Akash, so Akash being a Sanskrit word for this uh, multi-level consciousness. Fascinating. You know, I, I didn't know much about that. I'll, I'll have to delve into that, that book. But I also want to I want to switch gears for a little bit, Ralph. For a long time, you've been associated with psychedelics. You've written about them, spoken about using them, and are featured quite prominently in the film from a few years back, DMT, the Spirit Molecule. What do you think the psychedelic experience tells us about this mind equal brain equation we've been talking about? I think you've already told us that you're moving way past mind equals brain, but what in particular do you think psychedelics brings to that discussion? For me personally, uh, the psychedelic experience that, uh, I mean, there was a, a wave of popularity of psychedelics in the 1960s associated with the hip culture, so-called, and uh, that affected me at the at the time, so I had an experience that um, many 
of my colleagues had, but not a majority or anything. And for me personally, that gave uh, the idea that there's more to consciousness than ordinary consensual consciousness. Why necessarily? Because some materialists, scientists would say, no, it's just accessing another part of your brain, an imaginal part that is able to create things, and there really isn't any mystery there. Why, why does it, for you, seem to indicate that there is more? <laughs> uh, it, it's impossible to counter somebody else's uh, theory of my personal experience, and I can't uh, prove anything. I can only say that through my experience, I gained the fantasy um, that things are connected through an immaterial field, which is beyond science at present. And uh, this is, uh, of course, it could all be a delusion. I can't say it isn't. But anyway, this this idea, um, fantasy or psychically real or whatever, um, had a big effect on my professional work uh, because I started, uh, you know, I had during my psychedelic experiences, I had uh, the feeling that I understood them mathematically because of my training. I, you know, uh, I imaged my experience using mathematical tools. And so I could see, uh, I became convinced by these experiences in the 1960s that mathematics could actually be used to help explore um, these so-called paranormal effects that uh, that I experience as real, as kind of more more real than ordinary reality. That's the the a characteristic of the psychedelic experience, especially if you have several psychedelic experiences. This this uh, illusion may become stronger and stronger that there is a kind of feeling of reality about the altered consciousness um, because of the way things hang together and there's intelligence is revealed. It may be, uh, as many people claim, a shortcut to mystical experience that other people historically have have explored more using um, meditation or austerities like fasting and, and so on. Mm-hmm. I wonder, are you familiar with some of the recent research work that's been done by Dr. Robin Carhart harris and Dr. David Nutt in the UK where they actually did fMRI scans of folks who had ingested psilocybin? And their finding was quite surprising. I think it does maybe provide the beginnings of some of that scientific evidence for what you're talking about. Because what they found was that instead of an excitation in the brain, there was a reduced firing of the brain, kind of consistent with some of the data we get back from the near-death experience science that says, hey, these people are flatlined, and yet they're having the most profound conscious experience of their life. So it, it supports this idea that maybe this brain is more of a filter to this, a doorway to this larger consciousness. Are, are you are you familiar with that or would you? Uh, no, I'm not. It sounds fascinating because, uh, you know, after my uh, experiences in the 1960s and then going on since then with uh, meditation and also reading about other people's experience and talking to people about their experience, I, uh, you know, I, my intuition, my feeling that the mind is is not in the brain um, grew year by year stronger. So the, the idea that this sort of altered consciousness could be associated with reduced uh, activity in the biological neural net is, is very supportive. There remains the mystery, which honestly it boggles my mind, that by, by eating uh, some chemical, some uh, neuropeptide or a neurotransmitter or something, that, that you, you eat a chemical which is, has been manufactured by a plant, like a, a mushroom, and, and then you have this um, altered state of consciousness, 
it, it it boggles the mind because it shows that there is the intimate connection between the biological neural net and the physical brain and consciousness. And no matter how separated the cosmic consciousness or the collective unconscious might be from an individual biological neural net, nevertheless, there's some pathway of, of, of connection that involves the, the chemistry of a biological cell. Do you have any philosophical problems with the idea that we're kind of saying the answer lies outside here in this plant? I mean, does that create any challenges in terms of we're talking about this higher-ordered consciousness or really personal development in some way, and we're saying the answer is outside of us? It's something we have to ingest. Is that any philosophical concerns along those lines? No, I think it's great. I uh you know, it's a mystery. It's it's paranormal already. The um, you know, it's it's mysterious how drugs work to combat disease. It's mysterious how the immune system is able to uh, to cure an individual of tuberculosis. I mean, it's it's amazing. I have to tell you that uh, uh, the day I, I met Terence McKenna in. Uh, 1972, I believe it was, in the fall of 1972, when I was standing on a street corner in in Santa Cruz, and a friend drove by and said, "Get in the car. I want you to meet somebody." And took me on a drive that took two hours uh, to Berkeley, and introduced me to Terence McKenna, who was uh, who showed me a mushroom, uh, a psilocybin mushroom growing in a like a flower pot on his desk. And uh, he had the idea, of course, he was thinking about how the ingestion of a psychedelic mushroom could actually give you an altered state of consciousness. So he uh, he, he shared with me his uh, theory that the the mushroom spore was a, a visitor from uh, from space, and that the spore was uh, covered with a protective coating that was opaque to ultraviolet that allowed the uh, the DNA in the mushroom spore to survive the the journey through space. <laughs> that the the mushroom spore had then uh, invaded uh, planet Earth, and that the mycelial mat of these uh, mushroom colonies all over the planet was actually the intelligence that was guiding uh, the emergence of human species from. Uh, from primates into what we are today, uh, the modern Homo sapiens. So uh, this is uh, not as woo-woo as channeling from the Pleiades, uh, but uh, scientifically is pretty is pretty far out. Uh, anyway, it goes in the direction of let us say an experiment, uh, experimenting with the idea that the intelligence that we have is in the mushroom. So Terence, eventually he wrote a book on this subject called Food of the Gods, where the acquisition of language by uh, by primates 100,000 years ago or whatever, that this was a correlate of, of eating the psychedelic mushrooms. And uh, mm-hmm. in, in fact, I think it's widespread today in archaeology and anthropology the idea that there is a role of psychedelics in the simultaneous emergence uh, of art and religion and uh, speech and so on in uh, our Paleolithic prehistory. I did want to talk in the little bit of time that we have left about a couple of different things, if we could. One is the evolution of consciousness, something you've written about and talked about a lot, and it's become almost cliché that that this is happening, that there is some evolution of consciousness. But I, I have to wonder, is that about the whole topic of evolution? When we start talking about consciousness being outside of our brain, and then when we start talking about some of the problems we're, we're obviously going to have in understanding time and our relationship to time, and when we bring into the equation some of the paranormal phenomena, you know, one of the guests we've had on our show is a guy named Andy Paquette, who published a book, a very fascinating book. Uh, he's a 
he has lucid dreams and he has precognitive dreams. And he's recorded these for the last 20 years and he's recorded many that have been independently verified. I mean, if, and, and this is well known, it's so well known, but it's not accepted by science, of course. But if there's such a thing as a precognitive dream, then that's, uh, it, it kind of calls into question a lot of these ideas we have about time. And that, of course, calls into question a lot of these ideas we have about evolution, including the evolution of consciousness. So when we move into this beyond materialism, beyond mind equal brain, how do we keep our, how do we keep our bearings at all in terms of understanding these things in a way that really has, has meaning for us in, in the way we've been accustomed to? I don't know if it was my, <clears throat> my psychedelic experience or some other that uh, liberated me from belief in, in science, uh, like religious faith in science. But it's, uh, it's somehow within science that has given us a false impression of, of time, uh, the idea that the past is all determined and the future is undetermined, and there is some sharp uh, boundary, a membrane between the past and the future, which is advancing through time, like slicing cheese one slice at a time, and and putting a, a slice of the future into the past. So this kind of linear progression of time is sort of built into the basis of science, the scientific method, and and so on. But everyone's personal experience of time is rather different. And uh, especially lots of people have had uh, precognitive dreams, including me. <clears throat> so this particular kind of paranormal phenomenon, like we have uh, telekinesis, uh, telepathy, I mean, there are all these uh, areas of, uh, let's say, paranormal phenomenon that uh, advanced uh, scientists like Rupert Sheldrake and Dean Radin are exploring today. These are easy compared to the time paradox sort of uh, paranormal phenomenon like precognitive dreams. So that's uh, more difficult. So I have felt uh, as I went along in my career since the 1960s that making mathematical models for a real reality in which uh, Time presents different aspects. Um, mathematical models of consciousness in which a precognitive dream would be explained by the model. Uh, this has been important to me. <clears throat> so, in fact, you know, in my book, Demystifying the Akash, uh, so in, uh, jointly with my Indian friend, Shishi Roy, uh, quantum physicist, um, I have included there some mathematical models for uh, for this particular paranormal effect, the time uh, paradox effect, in which there is, uh, as they believe in India, some kind of object beyond time, uh, what Terence McKenna called the, the eschaton uh, uh, at the edge of time, a mathematical model in which there is this timeless thing and from it uh, precipitates ordinary reality in a way that gives the illusion of the serial events of ordinary time. So mathematical models can help you understand your own experience when it's being denied by orthodox science. But I think that's important, especially for children who do have these experiences and then and learn to suppress them. Great. I think that's probably a wonderful way to kind of wrap things up. In the couple of minutes we have left, Ralph, can you tell folks the best way to learn about some of the things that you're up to and some of the great books that you've written? Uh, well, you have a look at my website. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, disparate things and, <laughs> and uh, can be explored there. So ralph-abraham.org. Uh, then there's a menu on the left-hand side of the home page uh, with uh, items like uh, books, articles, lecture videos, and, and so on. And uh, just browsing around through the list of things that would be the easiest way to get an idea of the uh, 
the variety of my thinking and writing. And the list of articles, for example, there's about 130 of them there that are posted as, uh, as, as freely readable files. Great. Uh, with joint descriptions. I think that would be the way to start learning Ralph. Great, great. Well, it's certainly been uh, been interesting and love diving into the math stuff and the way that you've connected it is just truly amazing and so imaginative. Thanks so much. We have a lot to think about and discuss, and thanks again for joining me on Skeptico. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me. I've really enormously enjoyed this. Thanks again to Dr. Ralph Abraham for joining me today on Skeptico. A couple of questions I'd like to tee up for you from this interview that we might want to discuss on the forum or on the website. And there are two very different questions. The first has to do with this idea of evolution of consciousness, because it strikes me that we all assume that consciousness is evolving in a way that we understand. And we have a way of looking back at history, at science, and say, ah, we're evolving. Consciousness is evolving. But I'd like to turn that into more of a real question. What evidence do we have that consciousness is evolving in this way that we think it is? And if it is evolving, where is it evolving towards? And what's the evidence for that? So that's question number one. And question number two has to do with psychedelics. As you know, Dr. Abraham has been associated, along with Terrence McKenna, with the use of psychedelics, mushrooms, DMT, all that stuff. And there's this implied assumption in there that, hey, it's a good idea to perturb your consciousness, as I think Terrence McKenna once said. So I thought it'd be interesting to hash that out, because the implication seems to be, if we take it a certain way, that this perturbing of consciousness is part of this evolution of consciousness thing. Do psychedelics play a key role in the evolution of consciousness? And is this idea of perturbing consciousness and stirring it up something that is necessary for this, for the development of individual consciousness or for the evolution of consciousness in general? I have a lot of mixed feelings about this, so I'm really looking forward to saying what some of your ideas are. Now, of course, the place to share your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions is on the Skeptico website. It's at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O dot com. You can leave a comment right there or you can click on over to the forum and join the forum and dive into the dialogue there. Of course, while you're at the website, you're going to want to check out our more than 200 previous shows of Skeptico. They're all there for free download. If you enjoy them, please tell your friends, to tell your community about them like so many of you have. Well, that's going to do it for today. I have a number of interesting shows coming up. I hope you'll stay with me for all of that. But until next time, take care and bye for now. 